Welcome to this presentation that I've entitled uh, Getting Into Galatians and uh, Getting Galatians Into You. Basically, it's an introduction to the larger context of the Galatian letter. In other words, as you read this letter, both now and in the future, what is the geographical and historical context in which the words of Paul to the Galatians ought to be heard? I have just a few visuals for you in this presentation, and so I apologize on the front end for it not being as visually aided as most of my presentations, but I still thought it would be important for us to have this conversation to flesh out then again the historical context lying behind the Galatian letter. Now the first question that we need to talk about has to do with the recipients. And in fact, in the homework assignment, I typically ask, to whom was the letter of Galatians written? Now when you look at that question, you might you know, think it's a silly one, because obviously, duh, the letter to the Galatians was written to the Galatians. But that question is an important one, because it allows us to talk about two important things. One a simple important thing, and the other a more complicated one. The simple first point we need to make is the fact that the letter was addressed to the churches of Galatia. In other words, unlike almost all the other letters of the Apostle Paul, this letter is written to multiple congregations, churches. And therefore, we should think about this letter as perhaps a circular letter, a letter that is handed around or circulates from place to place. And so that's one unique feature about the letter of Galatians that we ought to keep in mind. The second and more complicated question has to do with the location of this uh, audience of these churches who received the letter uh, to the Galatians. And it has to do with the meaning of the word Galatia both before 25 BC as opposed to after 25 BC. So before 25 BC, if you said, oh, I'm writing a letter to the Galatians, it would have been pretty easy in terms of how it would have been understood. The term Galatia would have been used in an ethnic sense. Why? Because it refers to the geographic area where a particular group of people live, namely the Gauls. The Gauls. Now the Gauls uh, originally come from uh, Europe, from uh, the area of France. But what happened in about uh, the 3rd century BC, if I could point on the map, is the king of Bithynia, the king of Bithynia, invited about 20,000 Gauls into the region of Asia Minor in order to use them as a mercenary army. But what happened is he got more than he bargained. And these uh, Gauls, who by the way have a reputation always in the ancient world of being lovers of war and quite physical, violent people, um, and as a result, a lot of ancient people groups, especially the Romans, were a little bit scared by uh, the Gauls and invasions uh, from the north from the Gauls. So as a result, um, these, this mercenary army uh, was kind of running amok around Asia Minor, and it really took uh, another king in the area. And when we use king, make sure we're not talking about empires at this place point of history. We're talking about kings of cities or city-states. And so on the map again, I'm going to highlight Pergamum. So the king of Pergamum, who was actually a powerful king over a large area, his name was Attalus, Hence, we talk about the Attalid dynasty. And they controlled, actually, the whole region of Western Asia Minor. If you look at my cursor going all the way down, all this area was controlled by the Attalids, and their home city was Pergamum. And by the way, you can see that they set a city in the furthest part of their kingdom, if you will, uh, a frontier city, and they named it Italia, naturally, after uh, Attalus, uh, who was the head of this Pergamum dynasty. So King Attalus kind of defeated, or at least uh, restrained the Gauls, such that they ended up living in the center region of Asia Minor, or modern day Turkey, where my cursor is going. So the Gauls lived in this region called Galatia, which was in the center of Asia Minor. Just to go back to the King of Pergamum and the Gauls, I brought a couple of pictures here to help you think about them. 
Here we have uh, two monuments I'm going to show you, the so-called Dying Gaul Monument. So the king of Pergamum, King Attalus, commissioned artists to commemorate his victory over the Gauls. And so in Pergamum, on the Acropolis, it's a very prominent place there in Pergamum, uh, where the, the, the king of uh, the Pergamums lived, and there were also temples and other religious structures. There was also a temple to Athena, the goddess, among other things, of wisdom. Hence, there was a library associated with her up there. But in the courtyard from the Temple of Athena, in the courtyard from the Temple of Athena, we know there were a couple of these dying Gaul monuments. These are Roman copies of the original. And here's one. Uh, and they're very dramatic. And why would a king, Attalus, commission an artist to portray his enemy in a very dramatic, powerful way. Well, because the more powerful and noble you make your opponent, your enemy, well then, of course, that only increases uh, the, the stature that you have as one who conquered them. And so here we have a, a dying, gold, so, dying Gaul so, a soldier who has just killed his wife. So rather than allow his wife to become a slave for your uh, enemy, He's killed her, and that, of course, requires a very brave act to do, to kill someone you love, and rather have that than have them live in a, a shameful position as a slave. And now he's in the process of killing himself. Very dramatic pose, and you can see the blood in the marble statue. That's one of the dying Gaul monuments. And here's another one. So you can see here the soldier is wounded. He's got his sword on the ground. You can see the 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 mortal wound that he's he's committed suicide rather than submit. I have one more picture too. You can see that this person looks very un-Greek like, very un-Roman like. You can see it's very hairy. The hair is massive. You've got a mustache. You have a a powerful figure. And so going back to the map. So the reason we have a place called Galatia, again, prior to 25 BC, it refers in an ethnic way to an ethnic group of people, the Gauls, who were restrained in this center region of Asia Minor, which then had the name Galatia. However, after 25 BC, so now um, the Pergamum king is gone, and uh, Rome has been powerful all along, but they've taken over this region, and the Romans at different, period, Romans in different periods of their history would restructure things. So they, they decided to restructure this area, and they, they made this region, Galatia, a larger province, a larger province going all the way up to the north to the Black Sea. Look at my cursor, right? Going here, not all the way to the west, but following this kind of area, but down down to the south, down to the Mediterranean, that became now the province of Galatia. And so when Paul writes to the churches, plural, of Galatia, the question is, where did they live? Where were they located? And we know that Paul wrote to the Galatians after he had started these churches, after he had led them to Christ. So that means Paul has to write to a people where he traveled. And so we look at the map again, and hopefully we remember lots of details from our understanding of Paul's chronology. And we say, well, did Paul travel anywhere in this region in his life? And we know that on the first missionary journey, if you look at the map, he traveled in this area, these cities, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derba, and he landed at Perge and left from Italia. We know that he traveled on the first missionary journey in this region, which we could now call South Galatia, right? Galatia as a province goes way further north, but this would be people who live in the southern part of the province of Galatia. And so one way to look at the Galatian letters is they were written, and by the way, this is my preferred way of understanding the letters, and it's the most popular view today, is that Paul, after finishing the first missionary journey, and, important, before he leaves to go to Jerusalem for the first Jerusalem council, we'll come back to that in a minute, he then writes to the churches that he had recently founded and visited, and he learns that they're under attack from this group of people that we call Judaizers. We'll get to that in a minute, too. But one way to think of the letters, then, is they were written to southern Galatia, 
And this impacts dating then, because that means that they must have been written before the Jerusalem Council, which was held in 49 AD. And so then we want to date the Galatian letters, according to the South Galatian theory, about 48 AD. But there is an alternative. Again, not a popular alternative, not one that I favor. But the idea is, well, did Paul travel anywhere else later in his life in the province of Galatia? And the answer to that is yes. We have a very brief reference for him doing so both during his second missionary journey and during his third missionary journey. So in Acts 16.6, 6, we have a brief reference to him traveling through the Galactic and Phrygian region. So that would be another time where he could have maybe traveled to new places, started some new churches, and at the end of that trip, or sometime afterwards, wrote to the Galatians. Or the same scenario after the third missionary journey. That's found in Acts 18.23. Again, a very brief, brief reference to the region of Galatia. And so that leads to the possibility of Paul writing to a different group of Christians, not located in the south, but in the well, more accurately, the center, leaning a little bit toward the north, but certainly the north of the churches he visited during the first missionary journey. And that leads then to the alternative theory, the so-called North Galatian theory. And this, too, impacts the date of the, this letter. And that means we have to push the date back, although we have to be a little bit uh, flexible, because whether we date it after the second missionary journey or the third missionary journey, then of course um, the dates become much more variable, but it's typically dated anywhere in the 57, 58 kind of uh, region. So again, I'm a proponent of the South Galatian theory, and that's the most popular view today, but it's not one that you can shout, uh, but it's one that we can whisper because uh, the evidence leans more strongly toward the south than it does to the north. Permit me to share with you one piece of evidence which many scholars find quite important. It's not the only piece of evidence, but it certainly is a key one, and it has to do with the Jerusalem Council that we referred to just a minute ago. Just to refresh your memory, in Acts 15, we read about how, um, well, I can actually put it on the map. We'll come back to that maybe later. If you follow the cursor in Acts 15, we read about how some brothers from Jerusalem went down. I know on the map it looks like we're going up, but Jerusalem is 2,000 feet above sea level and Antioch is lower. So they, these brothers came down or traveled to the north to Antioch and they said, if you don't believe, uh, sorry, if you're not circumcised according to the law of Moses, you uh, cannot be saved. And so the Antiochian church um, uh, struggled with this, and instead of just simply saying, yes, you're right, and making everybody become circumcised, they sent Saul, or Paul, and Barnabas down to Jerusalem for the first so-called synod, the Jerusalem Synod. And at that synod, it was decided that uh, that Gentiles did not have to be circumcised. And then you may remember that they wrote a letter, uh, the so-called Apostolic Decree, in which they informed Gentile churches of their decision, namely that Gentiles don't have to be circumcised, but also some four other things though they had to worry about. And they sent those letters, not with Paul and Barnabas, with, with two of their own persons, uh, uh, Judas and uh, Silas. Now, how does that relate to Galatians? We're going to see, we haven't got there yet, but we're going to see, and maybe you know from your reading of the letter or other sources, that, uh, that, that Galatians is written in response to what? To opponents, people from Jerusalem, claiming to represent the pillars, that is, the apostles, namely James, the brother of Jesus, and Peter. So, so there are people who've invaded the Galatian churches and saying, you know, we represent the authoritative teachings of the apostles, and they say that you have to be circumcised. So, if Paul had written Galatians after this Jerusalem Council visit. After the apostles in Jerusalem had made a decision that Gentiles don't have to be circumcised, and after they had written that so-called uh, apostolic decree, this would have been the easiest thing in the world for Paul to refute, to shoot down. He could have just sat back and smiled inwardly to himself and let his opponents make their claim, and then after they were done, he could kind of pull out his letter, or if he didn't have it, he could refer to it and say, 
I just happen to know of a letter, an official decree from the very head apostles that these guys claim to re represent. And this decree, this letter from the apostles says exactly the opposite. Namely, Gentiles don't have to be circumcised. So the fact that Paul doesn't appeal in Galatians to this Jerusalem Council decision, it's almost unexplainable unless it hasn't happened yet. And so again, the most popular view is that Paul is writing to churches that he established on his first missionary journey, churches that are located in South Galatia, and he wrote the letter immediately or relatively quickly after visiting them and before he and Barnabas went to the Jerusalem Council, and that explains why he doesn't refer to the Jerusalem Council decision anywhere in the Galatian letter, even though it would be the perfect ammunition to refute the claims that his opponents were making. Well, that ends our maybe too long discussion, but it is an important one because it has implications for the dating and other things in New Testament theology often come back to the South versus the North Galatian theory. You might think it's a technical matter, but it's a big deal in academic circles. It ranks right up there with the great debates of all time, like taste great, less filling. New Testament scholars like to get together and say South Galatia, and the others say North Galatia, and they give some evidence one way or the other. But our important goal is to kind of concretize the people who received the letter to the Galatians. In other words, when we open the Bible and we hear Paul or God speak through Paul to the Galatians, I now have a, a, a place in my mind. I can envision them located there in southern Galatia where Paul visited and traveled on his first missionary journey. And now we want to go further than that because I have a mind. I see them now located here in the southern part of Galatia, but I want to know a little bit more about what was going on. Right? In technical terms, we say we want to know the sitsum laban, the situation in life. Or if you're talking about a four-page method, you want to say, well, what's the trouble in the text? What's going on in these churches? What is the problem that Paul is addressing? And in order to answer that question, we're engaging in a method that I uh, need to talk about. Because it's something we do when we reconstruct any letter of not just Paul, but of the New Testament. But we're involved, we're, when we do this, we're involving ourselves in a method that we need to know has been named and has some strengths and weaknesses. And so let's spend a few moments talking about this method called mirror reading. Mirror reading. Now, I'm not sure who first coined the phrase, but it stems from the fact, or at least the image, is that we stand in front of the Bible, and the Bible acts like a mirror. So in this case, we're standing in front of Galatians, and the letter of Galatians, the Bible mirrors, it reflects back, not just what Paul said, but also what was going on. It's kind of like reading between the lines or hearing what Paul says and then deducing what was the problem or what the opponents were saying. And it is often given the name mirror reading. I don't like that analogy. I have a better one, I think. I haven't got a, ca a catchy name for it, but I like to think of it as a phone conversation. So imagine you're in a room with somebody that you know, somebody you know well, for some of us it may be your spouse, but somebody you know well, and then the phone for this other person goes off, do 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 right? And then you hear this other person talk on the phone. So you hear only one half of the conversation. You don't hear what the person on the phone is saying on the other end. But even though you don't hear what the other person on the other end is saying, you nevertheless almost always can figure out very quickly who is on the other end, who the other person in your room is talking to, and not only who they're talking to, but what they're talking about. And so this is an analogy then for understanding the letters of Paul and the other documents of the New Testament. We have only one half of the conversation. We don't have a letter that the uh, Judaizers wrote, or even that the Christians in the Galatian churches wrote. We only have what Paul wrote. But even though we hear one half of the conversation, we can reconstruct what they, that is either the Christians in Galatia or the opponents who have invaded those churches, are saying. Now there are some scholars who recognize that there is a danger with this approach, and, and it's true. We can concede that. So 
Sometimes it happens when you're in a room with your beloved, whoever he or she may be, and their phone goes off, do 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 And then you listen for a while, and then you get off the phone, this person gets off the phone, you say, oh, you know, uh, what is Aunt Edna up to now? And then the other person says, I wasn't talking to Aunt Edna, I was talking to so-and-so. So in other words, sometimes we hear one half of the conversation and we don't hear enough of it or get enough information about it and we get it wrong. We make a wrong conclusion. And there are some scholars who think this is what happens with Paul. And they're so afraid about it happening with Paul, namely that we read into the letter things that aren't there, that they don't want to engage in this method at all. And as a result, they end up in a position of really knowing nothing at all or being afraid to say anything at all about the trouble in the text or that it's a real problem or that we know the real problem that Paul is addressing. And I think this is an overreaction. Here people are guilty of throwing the methodological baby out with the bathwater, right, to uh, tweak a, a contemporary expression. So I think we can use the method of mirror reading, but we just have to be careful how we use it. And so some scholars have developed criteria to make sure that we use it well. So, for example, one is the criteria of numbers. So, the more often that Paul explicitly refers to either an event or a teaching, the more confident we can be about reconstructing what the other half is. I mean, that's true in our conversation, our phone conversation analogy, too. The more often the person on the other, uh, the, the more often the person you hear in the room says something like Aunt Edna or something specific about what they're talking, the more confident you can be about reconstructing what the other half of the conversation, uh, what the other end of the line is saying. And it has to do not just with frequency, but also with specificity. I mean, it'd be one thing if the phone, you know, if the, if the, if the person in your room answers and they just say, Hi, Auntie. So you've got a little clue. On, oh, they're talking to an aunt, and maybe you can deduce from the rest of the conversation which aunt it is. But if the person in the room says, Hi, Auntie Edna, well, then you can be reasonably confident that the person is talking to Aunt Edna. So when we apply this criteria now to the New Testament, right, we can, with some confidence, use the method of mirror reading, or my analogy of a phone conversation, to reconstruct the problem in the text, the trouble in the text, the sitsum laban, the, the situation in life that's going on. And again, we can shout where the evidence allows us to shout, but we should whisper where the evidence requires us to whisper. So, for instance, if you were going to write a sermon on Colossians, and you did some research and you read about people talking about the quote so-called Colossian heresy, the so-called Colossian heresy. Well that's already a tip because when you did some more research you would see that when you mirror read the Colossian letter there's a hint that there's a heresy that Paul is addressing but it's not so clear. Anyway, a few scholars think it's there, and hence the name the Colossian heresy, but there are a lot of scholars who don't find it there, or certainly recognize that it's not very clear, and so now they refer to it as the so-called Colossian heresy, because when you add so-called, that shows that you're maybe a little skeptical about whether or not there really was a heresy at work in the Colossian church, and that which Paul is responding to. And so, uh, again, we can engage in mirror reading, uh, but we just have to use it properly, and uh, where the evidence is strong, well, then we can be strong in our claims. And when it's not so strong, well, then we have to be appropriately quiet. So now, let's get back to Galatians, and let's engage in a mirror reading, an appropriate mirror reading of Paul's letter to the Galatians. And the first thing that I am going to discover when I mirror read the letter is that there were opponents in the church. And I'm not just imagining it, but there are lots of texts where we find it. And I can see here one seven. Some people are throwing you into confusion. Now, when I read that, I'm not imagining things. If I say, you know, I think there are some people who have invaded the church that are causing them to be confused. And if it were only the one reference, then I'd have to be a little tentative. But there are lots more. Three one, we read, "Who has bewitched you? Somebody has tricked the uh, Galatian readers." 4.17 is an important verse. Those people are zealous to win you over, but not for good. The word zealous is an important word. These people are not just kind of somewhat interested in pushing some agenda. No, they're zealous. They're passionate about it. 5.7, who has cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? 5.10, the one who is throwing you into confusion. And then my uh, 
well, I could say my favorite verse, uh, just favorite because of the shock value for modern readers, if they don't know that this is found in the Bible. Paul says, as for those agitators, those troublemakers, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Well, that's actually a softer way of saying castrate themselves, right? Those people pushing circumcision, Paul says, I wish they'd, you know, go further and, uh, you know, uh, castrate themselves. And that, of course, is a powerful reflection of how strong Paul feels about the situation and how dangerous uh, the context of the church is. And then finally, 612, those who want to make a good impression outwardly. And so when you look at these texts, we have many of them, and we've got specific references. And so with good justification, we can talk about the fact that there are opponents, people who have invaded these Galatian churches and who are pushing an agenda, and it's not, Paul says, for their good. Okay, so now I'm envisioning these churches in South Galatia as I look again on the map. I'm envisioning them being invaded. Can I learn more about them? And the answer is yes. So again, we engage in a mirror reading. And um, if you read the letter carefully, there are certain key topics that seem to come up multiple times. And so what are these topics? Well, one topic that gets a lot of attention in the letter is the issue of circumcision. Circumcision. And you have to ask yourself, why does Paul keep talking about circumcision? And the natural answer is, well, somehow it must relate to what's going on in the Galatian churches. Somehow that must be an issue for them too. And so uh, we have texts like 5.2 and 5.3 and 6.12 and 6.13 and 6.15. And there are also references in chapter 2, 3, 2, 7, and 2.12. Now if you looked at those references, and if you look at my map, you would see that they refer to circumcision in the context of Antioch, this Antioch over here in Syria. But wait a minute, Paul isn't going to be talking to Christians over here in southern, southern Galatia about something that happened over here in this Antioch, unless somehow what happened there is relevant for them in Galatia. And so those texts are relevant too. So one big concern of the letter seems to be circumcision. Another big concern of the letter has to do with the Mosaic Law. There are many, many references to the law, the law, the law, the law of Moses specifically, and so forth. And so that suggests that, I guess, a big issue in the church has to do with the law. There's just one text, uh, so it's not many, but it is suggestive. 4.10, we read, You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. Now, there are a number of religions, right, that had a kind of what we would call a cultic calendar, right? They follow a special calendar, special days that involve special activities. And so we have to maybe think about what that might refer to, but 410 is important. There's also a hint about food restrictions. And again, that's referring to not what's taking place right now in uh, southern Galatia, but Paul refers to the Antioch incident. That's the Antioch over here in Syria. This is the kind of embarrassing showdown between Paul and Peter, because apparently Peter was chowing down with uh, Gentiles, no problem, and then suddenly when some people some people of the circumcision came uh, down from Jerusalem, suddenly he turned down those dinner invitations, and he only ate with Jews, and he only ate, you know, what would be considered clean food. So again, we say, now why is Paul telling the Galatians about something that happened far away from them over in Antioch of Syria, unless it does somehow relate to what's going on in their churches too? So we throw that into the mix in trying to understand what the opponents were saying or pushing or advocating. And then the last one is a lot bigger theme than I ever realized until I did some work, and that is, who are the rightful heirs or the sons of Abraham? Sometimes I say it this way, who gets to sing that annoying Christian song, Father Abraham had seven sons, seven sons had Father Abraham. I don't know if you know that song, but it is annoying because it's like the wheels on the bus go round and round. This is a, a Christian ditty that can go on and on and on. But the question I want you to ask is, why would you want to sing that song? Why would you, if you're a Gentile, want to call Abraham your father? Well, the answer is, if he's your father, that means you're in the family. And if you're in the family, that means you get the inheritance. You get to share in all the goodies, all the blessings. And uh, there are lots of references to Abraham or Abraham's wives and his sons by these wives. Why? Because 
who gets to call Abraham their father? And the real question is, is it just Jews? Or can Gentiles too call Abraham their father? And so now we look at all of these texts, all of these different themes, and we kind of say to ourselves, all right, now, what first century group would be interested in things like circumcision, the law, uh, religious calendar, uh, food and unclean food, and Abraham, and who is a legitimate heir of Abraham, right? I mean, the answer is obvious, but I mean, that's the way you think about it. You say, now, I, I, what do I know from my research about the different kind of people groups, the different kind of ethnic groups, the different kind of religions, you know, who does this likely describe? And the answer is a fairly easy one in this case. It describes Jews, or in this case, because the letter clearly implies that these are followers of Jesus, so these are Jewish Christians, Jewish Christians, Christ followers. Now, we happen to have a name that we give to not just Jewish Christians who emphasize circumcision, the law, and other things, but even Gentiles who emphasize circumcision, the law, and other things. We give the name Judaizers. And we sometimes even use it as a verb, right? We talk about a Judaizing tendency or acting in a Judaizing way. And by that we typically mean, oh, you're emphasizing certain elements of the law, right, in a legalistic way that undermines uh, the gospel message of grace. And we can supplement this idea, not just from the letter of Galatians, but we can supplement it with two texts from Acts. You look at the map again. So I'm quoting from Acts 15, verse 1, because Acts 15, verse 1, you see it on the cursor there. I want you to envision these are brothers, because it says in Acts 15, verse 1, some men came down from Judea to Antioch. There they come. See them? They're coming down. Remember Jerusalem, 2,000 feet up, down to Antioch. And it says, again, Acts 15, verse 1, and we're teaching the brothers, quote, Unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. And so, if we had Jewish Christians, Jewish brothers, who were motivated enough to go from Jerusalem down or north to Antioch to say that, namely, unless you're circumcised, you can't be saved, it's not hard to imagine that they went around the corner and further west into South Galatia and also said, oh, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. So, so Acts 15 supports the plausibility of our historical reconstruction. And one other text I think is important, and that's Acts 21.20. Acts 21.20. So Paul ends up in Jerusalem, and James and the other leaders of Jerusalem are telling Paul about, quote, how many thousands of Jews have believed? So these are also then Jewish Christians, Jewish believers. But then this added phrase, again, Acts 21, 20, and all of them are zealous for the law. All of them are zealous for the law. So what we have are thousands of newbie Christians, thousands of new Jewish converts, and what's more, we read that a lot of them were zealous, passionate about the law, and so it's entirely plausible that somebody has this kind of passion or zeal for the law would be upset then uh, with a message that Paul perhaps proclaim, namely that somehow circumcision wasn't important. They might be motivated to travel to other newbies, to other Christians, Gentile Christians in places like South Galatia, and challenge them with the importance of circumcision and other Jewish matters. And so as we reconstruct, as we mirror read Galatians, we can come with a pretty definite, a pretty accurate picture of the opponents and what was going on. And to this point then, what, were there is, what they were doing is they were advocating a gospel that Paul says in, in Galatians 1 verse 7 is no gospel at all. They were arguing about the importance about Jesus plus, as I might put it. What do I mean by that? It means you have to believe in Jesus plus you've got to be circumcised. You've got to believe in Jesus plus you've got to pay more attention to the Mosaic law. You've got to believe in Jesus plus you've got to be a little more careful about the kind of food you do and don't eat. You've got to believe in Jesus plus a little more careful about this Jewish religious calendar and so forth. And as soon as you say Jesus plus, 
It doesn't matter whether the plus is a big thing or a small thing. What you're doing is you're undermining the sufficiency of Christ's redemptive work. You're saying believing in Jesus and Jesus' sacrifice is not enough. There's something else that has to be done and we have to do. And this is theologically anathema to Paul. That's why he says it's no gospel at all. He says, even if an angel from heaven came to you with a gospel different than the one that we came to you originally, let that one be accursed. I mean, that's, that's really strong language. But that's how serious the matter is. And so one of the things that Paul wants to do in the Galatian letter is he wants to, I guess, reject this legalizing, Judaizing theology, this false gospel, right, and remind his readers of his true faith-based gospel that he preached to them when he first led them to Christ. But there's more. So there's a second thing that we also have to think of, and that is these Judaizers not only had a bad theology, they had, as we parents sometimes would say, a bad tood, right? Sometimes we say that about our kids. They've got a bad attitude. And these Judaizers also had a bad attitude towards Paul's claim to apostleship. They thought he was only an apostle wannabe. He was only a pretend apostle. And therefore, wasn't worth listening to. And we can reconstruct pretty accurately, I think, what these Judaizers were saying. All right? So they would say something like this to the Galatians. And I'm getting this all from mirror reading Galatians. Right, carefully, appropriately, especially looking at the letter opening and the changes that Paul made to the opening and the Thanksgiving section. They said something like this. They said, we're glad you Galatians are believers of Jesus. We're believers of Jesus too. We too are Jesus followers, and we're we're you know we we can we're, we can concede that Paul was at least good in in sharing you the gospel, but but I'm afraid uh, you know he's he's misled you. Um, and I'm afraid he's misled you uh, not only with the gospel, but with his past history. I, I bet you he didn't tell you about all the dam. No, he didn't. He didn't tell you, did he, about all the damage he did in those early years, about how he persecuted the church. Ah, he, he didn't. He conveniently forgot to mention that to you. And the apostles, by the way, whom we come from, the apostles James, the brother of Jesus, and Peter, and the others, they were very kind to Paul. They were willing to forgive him all the damage he'd done. They were, they, they were even willing to let him preach, but. He's a maverick. He's, he's a wild man. He's gone way beyond their teachings. In fact, well, what do you expect from somebody who wasn't even a, 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 an apostle, right? I mean, Paul was never an apostle of Jesus. He didn't really hang out with Jesus. James did. James was the brother of Jesus, and, and Peter did. And, and we come from those head boys in Jerusalem. We reflect the authoritative teachings of the apostles, and they have a gospel, nothing at all, like Paul has shared with you, and so on. And actually, they can make a pretty good case, because it's true, Paul did persecute the church in a very destructive way in the early days, and, and uh, Paul was never a disciple of Jesus, and, uh, and so forth. And that's why Paul is so uh, worked up in this letter about not only defending his gospel, but depend, defending his apostleship. And uh, that's why he had those preemptive strikes that we perhaps... Uh, that you perhaps remember we noted earlier in the opening of Galatians. It's not because Paul's so vain. It's not because he wants everyone to know that he's an apostle. Huh, and he you know, deserves respect. But he knows that his apostleship, if you undermine that, that might undermine the message that he gave as an apostle. And so both of these things are at play. And so, dear friend, as you read the Galatian letter, and it's an important letter. It ought to be a big part of your personal Christian life and your Christian ministry, this is the larger historical context in which that letter needs to be heard. I'm hoping you have a, an image in your mind. You see these people somewhere here in South Galatia, these people that Paul led to Christ on his first missionary journey. You see these people who have been invaded, yeah, and, and, and quite successfully so, by, the, by these people claiming to represent the pillars, the head boys in Jerusalem. And how they were emphasizing a work-based, circumcision, law-oriented gospel that Paul says is no gospel at all. Instead, I hope you see Paul doing two big things throughout the whole letter. First and foremost, he's defending his faith-based gospel in distinction from that law-based gospel that his opponents are pushing or advocating. And two, he's uh, defending his apostleship. 
And so, dear friends, if you keep that in mind, I think that will concretize, it will historicize the important theology that is found in Galatians. And when you hear, then, his letter to the Galatians, it will seem more real to you. You can envision these people. You can understand the struggle they're going through. And that will hopefully also make it more real for you and for your audience uh, that you're ministering to uh, today. Thanks for your attention.